Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to the 18th lecture on economics, management and entrepreneurship. In our last lecture, we introduced the subject of financial statements. In that, we said that there are mainly two financial statements. One is balance sheet and the other is income statement or profit and loss statement. In the balance sheet, we basically say the financial status of an organization on a particular debt and income statement says how a company or an organization has performed in the last year, usually last year. Now, we had considerably uh, we had spent considerable time in discussing various items that appear in the balance sheet. In particular, we group those items under two headings, one assets and the other the liabilities. And we had discussed in detail fixed assets and current assets under the assets heading and under liabilities we had consider two types of liabilities. One, the liability to the owners, this is known as owner's equity and the liability to outsiders such as suppliers or from uh, the financial institutes or others from whom the company might have borrowed money. Now, these things we had discussed in great detail in the last lecture. Towards the end of the lecture, we had initiated the discussion on income statement. Today, we shall discuss all the items that come under the income statement. First, let us see once again the picture that we had shown in the last lecture on income statement. If we look at this picture once again, this says how the earnings that is retained by the company are calculated. First, this let us say is the gross sales line. This is something like a datum line and this is the gross sales. So, this is gross sales minus returns, discounts or bad debts. If we subtract from gross sales, we get net sales. From net sales, if we subtract cost of goods sold, we are left with gross profit. From the gross profit, if we subtract general and administrative expenses and selling expenses, which together constitute the operating expense, then what we get is the profit out of the operations or also known as operating profit. And on operating profit there can be, we add to it income from various other sources. Recall that the company might have invested idle cash in certain other companies that are not uh, this company's job in particular. Therefore, it is not part of the operations of this particular company, but nevertheless it is a income from other investments that the company might have made. So, this is added to the operating profit. What we get is profit before income, before interest and taxes. If we subtract the interest expense, 
then we get profit before tax and then from this if we subtract the income tax estimated income tax we get profit after tax or which is also known as net profit and from net profit the company might decide to pay dividends to its shareholders and therefore, what is retained is the earnings that are retained in the company for reinvestment. Now, let us understand that dividends are usually a, a decision to be taken by the board of directors of the company. Even though normally when the profit net profit is high the dividends paid are high and when the net profit is low dividends paid are low. However, it is not always so even when a company may lose may have a loss in a particular year the company may still decide to pay dividends to its shareholders. Similarly, if the net profit is very high even then the company may not proportionately increase its dividends that are given to its shareholders, because it may decide to retain much of its profit for reinvestment in its own company. Earnings therefore, in fact this net profit the, the owners are actually the owners of the company they own this amount, this amount they get but this amount which they forfeit to the company they are basically the shareholders are the real owners of these earnings. Therefore, paid in capital by the shareholders plus this retained earning which they forfeit for the reinvestment in the company is actually the total amount that is called the owners equity. Now, we take a particular example for x y z company for the year ended March 31. In this case gross sales is taken as 7 million 300 thousand rupees and from here there are this is to be subtracted returns and allowances, discounts and estimated loss on uncollectible accounts together amount to something like 800,000 rupees which we subtract from the gross sales. So, gross sales is actually the unit price multiplied by the number of units sold, but if we subtract this then we get the net sales as 6 million 500,000 rupees. From this we subtract cost of goods sold. The various elements that are taken here are the direct material written here as stocks 900,000, the labor direct labor wages and salaries is 3 million rupees, total depreciation this is shown separately, but it could have been added with the overall expenses but it is shown separately because this is quite considerable this is 900,000 other manufacturing expenses basically other overhead expenses factory overhead expenses FOH amount to 500,000 this total to 5 million 300,000 rupees that is the COGS cost of goods sold. Therefore, subtracting cost of goods sold from net sales we get gross profit also known as gross margin as 1 million 200 thousand rupees. From here we subtract the expenses that are not incurred in the factory these are the expenses incurred in the factory 
and these are expenses incurred outside the factory by the administration and the marketing or the selling department. Here G and A expenses general and administrative expenses amount to nearly 300,000 rupees. Selling expenses amount to 200,000 rupees. Totaling these are called the operating expenses. This total 500,000 rupees. Therefore, from out of the operations that is production and selling the profit amount to subtracting this this 500,000 from 1 million 200,000 we get 700,000 rupees as operating profit. So, this is written down here and here what we have done is adding other income from other sources. So, if the company has invested in fixed deposits it will get interests and if it has invested in other companies shares it will get dividends. These are surpluses which are not out of its own operations. Therefore, they are called non operating surplus. Here, this added together interests and dividends are added together and they amount to 110,000 rupees, and this is to be added with the operating profit out of its own operations. Therefore, profit for interest and tax amount to 810,000 rupees. From out of this the interest expenses are first of all subtracted. One is if the company has borrowed money from financial institutions such as bank it pays interests plus if it has if it has got money from uh, by uh, bonds or debentures, then it has to pay also interests to the bond holders or debenture holders. This amount is 35,000 and this amount this amounts to 100,000. Together this comes to 135,000 rupees that is the interest expenses. Therefore, from PBIT profit before interest and tax, if we subtract the interest expenses, then we are left with profit before tax that is 675,000 rupees. Hence, hence uh, this is the PBT profit before tax. On this, the income tax is actually paid. The income tax let us say in this case is 350,000 rupees. Then subtracting the tax income tax from profit before tax we get what is called net profit or net margin or profit after tax 325,000 rupees is what the company is left with. Now, from out of this if you remember we have to subtract dividends. So, profit after tax profit after tax was 325,000 rupees and from out of this the company may decide to pay dividends. Recall that it is it has to pay the preference dividends first let us say that this amount amounts to 50,000 rupees and the equity holders the common stock holders let us say that they get 100,000 rupees. Therefore, the total dividends could be 150,000 rupees. Now, if we subtract 150,000 rupees from 
profit after tax this amount comes to something like 125 minus 150 is 175. 175,000 rupees is actually the earnings for the company that is retained in this year. Now, last year let us say from the last year financial statements let us say the retained earning was 1,525,000 rupees. To this we add this year's earning which comes to the difference of this which is 175,000 rupees. If we add 175,000 rupees to 1,525,000 rupees, then we get 1,700,000 rupees which is the retained earning at the end of the present year. In fact, one more row could have been shown here as just earning this year which is 325,000 minus 150,000 rupees. Let me do that to make it clear. Let us call it Now, you see earnings is basically the difference if we subtract dividends from profit after tax. So, 150,000 to be subtracted from 325, we are left with 175,000 rupees. This 175,000 rupees is added to 1,525,000 rupees, which was the retained earning at the end of the last year. So, the return earning at the end of this year becomes 1,700,000 rupees. This day, this is called accumulated return earning statement. Now, let us talk about different items and how these items are defined. Let us understand that financial statements are prepared for an accounting period and that period could be a year, could be half a year or it could even be a quarter of a year. So, we define here the meaning of an accounting period, it is usually one year for external reporting and is called a financial year an amount paid for goods bought during the financial year is treated as payment during that year. And similarly, the reverse is true for receipt. An amount received for goods sold during the financial year is treated as receipt during that year. And an amount paid against goods to be bought during the next financial year is an advance payment and is to be treated as an asset. So, this is a payment made by the company in advance in anticipation of getting goods from its supplier. So, goods have not reached us, but we have made advance payment. So, this is an advance payment. Similarly, if we get advance an amount uh, an advance amount for supplying goods to the customers, for selling goods to the customers, but we have really not sold the goods to the customers, then it is called an advanced receipt. An amount received against goods to be sold during the next financial year is an advanced receipt 
and is to be treated as a liability. Next we the various items that appear in the income statement we have now given definitions of, of each. It is the sum of the invoice price of goods sold during the accounting period that considers returns, allowances, discounts and bad debt. Invoice means whenever certain items are sold a performa invoice is also sent to the customer that says this is the unit price and this is the amount sold therefore the gross sales is this and if there are discounts given or other things given they have to be subtracted from the gross sales to find out net sales. Next COGS we have already discussed in detail is the sum of direct material, direct labor and factory overheads that are attributed to goods that are sold in the accounting period. Remember this we are talking about cost of goods sold and not cost of goods manufactured. Therefore, we might have manufactured 100 items in a particular accounting year, but if we sell only 50 then we have to consider the cost of making those goods making only 50 items that is the cost of goods sold. Then the net sales minus the cost of goods sold is gross profit or gross earnings or gross income. Next operating expenses means both general and administrative expenses and selling and distribution expenses both include other than the factory expenses which are known as operating expenses. Now, if we subtract the operating expenses from gross profit we get operating profit. Then the term non operating surplus it represents the gains from such activities of the firm as investment in government bonds and securities of other firms that are not the normal activities of the firm. So, these are surplus money that the company invests short term investments for which it gets interests and that increases its profit if it is negative it represents a deficit. When we add operating profit with the surplus we get PBIT profit before interests and tax. As I already said interest expenses are the interests paid by the company to banks and debenture holders or bond holders. Profit before tax is profit before interest and tax PBIT minus the interest paid. Taxes are calculated following the government rules, income tax rules. If we subtract income tax from PBT profit before tax, we get profit after tax or net profit. Dividends are paid to stockholders only if the directors, board of directors approves of it and they are not expenses. Expenses are those that are that are subtracted from sales to find out profit, but dividends are subtracted from profits to find out the earnings. Therefore, dividends are not to be confused with expenses. Earnings are profit after tax less the dividends that are ploughed back by the company in its own investment for growth and sustenance of the company's activities. Now, 
we have discussed the two major financial statements the balance sheet and the income statement now as i already told you different ledger accounts are kept for each and every item of a company but financial statements such as balance sheet and profit and loss statement they are basically summaries of all those accounts now when we say direct material one is not going to go into the details of which worker is working which shop being manufactured they are available in detail form in different ledger accounts what is normally done is that all those accounts are summarized and in the summary form they appear in what is called a general ledger a general ledger is a set of accounts which can be directly looked into or directly analyzed to prepare the main two financial statements and each such general ledger is supported by a set of subsidiary ledgers subsidiary ledgers contain actually the details of each item of a general ledger account therefore we define a general ledger as a collection of the group of accounts that supports the items shown in the major financial statements so if one likes to see how wages and salaries have been paid they go first of all to the general ledger and then from the general ledger they go to the supporting ledgers even for more greater details subsidiary ledgers give the details of the individual items in the general ledger accounts so subsidiary ledgers actually give in much greater detail the different accounts they are summarized and are made into accounts of general ledger from out of which the financial statements are prepared now we already know that there are two important financial statements one is balance sheet and the other is income or profit or loss statement now there is of late a demand for another financial statements it is called a statement of cash flows although not mandatory the various companies also publish a statement of cash flows it's not mandatory by the companies act companies act say that only the balance sheet and the financial statements need to be published and put to the shareholders given to the shareholders statement of cash flows is although not mandatory is very popular and it shows how cash has been received or cash has been disbursed and what is the initial cash position and the final cash position of the company and how or what is the liquidity condition of the company now therefore statement of cash flows is also gaining ground in recent days it reports the cash receipts and cash payments of an organization during a particular period so you can see the emphasis is on cash receipts and on cash payments or cash disbursements during a particular period it shows the relationship of net income to changes in cash balances it reports past cash flows to predict future cash flows if we know the way we have been spending our cash on different activities we can predict the future cash flows as well 
we can evaluate management's generation and use of cash. We can determine a company's ability to pay interest and dividends and to pay debts when they are due. This is very important because unless the liquidity position of a company is high, the banks may not be ready to extend or to lend any money to the company for meeting their short term financial or working capital needs. Similarly, if debts are not paid in time, then the suppliers may not be interested or ready to sell their products on credit. Therefore, materials for example, may not be easily available to the company. So, it also reveals commitments to assets that may restrict or expand future courses of action. Basically, cash flows if a company has got good uh, volume of cash, it means that it can meet short term obligations. It can pay money to its own employees in time, it can pay uh, money to the suppliers from whom material may have been purchased it may not be a defaulter in paying interests to the banks and to the uh, uh, or even paying taxes. So, all this will depend on the cash position of a company. A company may be uh, doing very good profit, but yet it may not have sufficient cash because it might have invested all its money in various other activities not having enough cash to pay its or to meet its short term obligations, what we say the working capital need. Working capital means if you remember current assets minus current liabilities, particularly it means paying for buying materials, paying for making the payments uh, on interests, taxes, insurances and other such important things. Therefore, the liquidity position of a company which is determined by the position of its cash is quite important and therefore, the statement of cash flows is quite important. Now, what are the typical activities that influence the position of a cash? First, is the operating activities. And every time we find out cash inflows and cash outflows, one collections from the customers, interests and dividends collected. If the company has invested in certain bonds or in certain in shares of certain other companies, it get dividends. If it has bought bonds, it gets interests and other operating receipts. So, these are the main cash inflows. Collection from the customers is the main thing. Remember that if most of the sales take place on credit, then cash sales are less, then cash inflow may be less, but those who had bought goods last year or many days ago, they should pay the money back to the company. Therefore, cash inflow may take place not just because of current sales, but because of credit sales that have taken place sometime in the past. So, cash, cash collection could be out of cash sales in the present year and credit sales in the past year or even in the present year, if the cash collection time is less than a year, which it should be. Now, these are 
different sources of gas inflows. Now, let us see where the gas flows out of the company. Gas flows out of the company to the suppliers from whom the company might have purchased materials or even to utility supplier. Cash payments to employees, its own employees in the form of wages and salaries. Taxes paid as interest to financial institutions. Cash paid as income tax and other operating cash payments. So, out of the business of operating activities in the factory basically, these are from its own operations, these are the cash inflow and outflow. Now, consider the investing activities. Cash may also take place, inflow or outflow may take place because of gas inflow may take place because of sale of property, plant and equipment. If the company decides to sell its land or buildings or its some of its equipment, then also there is a cash inflow. If the company sells its securities or shares that it is holding uh, securities of other companies that also is a cash inflow and also cash inflow takes place when suppose that it has uh, it has given a loan in the form of bond to others and they pay back so you get cash inflow now on the outflow side we have if you buy land or buy buildings and other plant equipments machines then also cash flows out of the company. If you buy shares of other companies then also cash flows out and if you I am sorry not take loan, but give loans this should be giving loan rather than taking loan. If you give loans then also cash flow out. So, out of the investing activities which not which is not part of your own operations, but nevertheless here gas inflows or outflows take place then these are the various reasons. Apart from that there are also other activities such as financing activities. Here you borrow gas from creditors issue equity shares then in both for on both occasions cash inflows take place and here cash outflow will take place for just the opposite reasons repayment of borrowed amount repurchase of equity shares and payment of dividends so broadly we can see that cash inflows and outflows take place on three headings operating activities, investing activities and financing activities. Now, here we give an example of statement of cash flows for the year ended March 31, 2000. But of course, we have not given the actual values 
but we are expecting the values will be here. Uh, whatever we had written earlier, we are now tabulating them in a structural fashion. Cash flows from operating activities, cash collection from customers minus all this payments to suppliers, payments to employees, payment for interest, for taxes and all these add up to total cash payment of this. Total of these four is this and if this is within parenthesis indicating that this is negative so to be subtracted from the inflow. So, inflow minus outflow gives the net cash provided by operating activities. So, this minus this is equal to this. Next, we look at cash flows from financing activities. Here, we have purchase of fixed assets, proceed from sale of fixed assets, this is negative. If we purchase, we pay out cash, therefore, this is within parenthesis, meaning that this is a negative thing. Proceed from sale of fixed assets. If we sell some of our own assets, this is positive. Therefore, net cash used in investing activities could be either positive or negative. I am assuming here that we purchased more amount of fixed assets and sell less amount of fixed assets. Therefore, the net is a purchase for which we pay out cash. Therefore, it is a cash outflow which means it is negative and therefore, it is in the parenthesis within the parenthesis. So, this is a cash outflow, this is a cash inflow. So, net cash inflow from operating act activity is positive net cash flows from financing activities is however, negative. Now, cash flows from financing activities proceeds from issue of long term debt. When you are issuing then it is a cash is coming in. So, it is a cash inflow it is positive proceeds from issue of common stock this also is positive the common stock is issued to the market. So, cash comes in dividends paid however, is negative therefore, it is within parenthesis and the sum of all these three is net cash provided by financing activities is cash coming in through issue of long term debt and issue of common stock less the dividends paid and that is is positive. So, the sum of this net cash provided by operating activities, the net cash used in investing activities or oh, there is a there is a mistake here this should be investing I am sorry this should be cash from investing activities uh, net cash is this net cash the operating activities is this net cash in investing activities is negative is this and then the net cash provided by financing activities is this. So, if you add all the three then it may be negative or it may even be positive. So, all the three in this case could be negative therefore, it is put within parenthesis. So, this is the net decrease in cash. Now, look at your balance sheet 
of 1999, March 1999, find out from the assets the cash position. So, that is the cash position and the net decrease in cash in this case is this. Therefore, if you subtract this amount from the cash position held in 1999, end of 1999, then what you get is the cash position at the end of March 2000 here and this amount should match with the cash position of March 2000. For example, in our case In our case, end of 2000, March 31st, 2000, cash and bank is 950,000. So, we expect that if you have a statement of cash flows, then 99 figure plus or minus the net plus or minus the net increase or decrease in cash, these two should give the 2000 March 31 figure that appears in the balance sheet of 2000. If it does not match, it means that reconciliation has to be made or accounting, laser accounts must be once again scrutinized to see where the mistake is occurring. <coughs> now, cash flows a statement of cash flows are related to the balance sheet and the income statement. Now, I am giving here just three examples to show how they are related. Let us say that cash collected from customers in this year, what would be its value? Its value will be sales that have take, taken place plus beginning accounts receivables, whatever amount was due to be received from the customers minus the ending accounts receivables plus the sales would give the cash collected from customers. This is same as sales plus the difference between these two, which is decrease or increase in accounts receivables. So, these two would be equal to cash collected from customers. Therefore, one can actually if we maintain balance sheet, find out the accounts receivables last years and this years, add to it the sales that appears in the income statement. These two appears in the liability side of the no, the asset side of the financial statements. Then we get cash collected from customers. Similarly, if we look at payment to suppliers, payment to suppliers similarly can be shown as cost of goods sold plus increase or decrease in inventory plus decrease or increase in accounts payable. So, accounts payable and inventory, these values inventory is in asset side of the balance sheet, accounts payable is in the liability side of the balance sheet and increase and decrease means that we have to consult last year's balance sheet and this year's balance sheet add to it the COGS which is available in the income statement of this year to find out the payment that has been made to the suppliers in this year. And in a similar fashion we can find out cash payments to employees which is basically wages and salaries of this year plus decrease or increase in the accrued salaries payable or wages payable. That means, you have to consider the last year's uh, liability in the balance sheet, liability side of the balance sheet, find out the difference and that you add to this year's expense then you get how much payment has been made to employees. So, friends 
what we have done in course of our discussion on financial statements is that a company must publish its financial statements in the form of a balance sheet and a profit and loss statement. In addition, it can also decide to also prepare and publish a summary cash flow statement. Cash flow statements as I have just now shown, showed, they are related to both balance sheet and the profit and loss statement of last year and this year and also the income statement. So, if we are maintaining accounts properly, then we shall see that they more or less match. There can be occasions where they do not match. In such situations, it is necessary that we look into our accounts and see whether any gross mistake has taken place during the accounting stage. So, we have discussed in detail various items, their ramifications, their meanings, giving particular examples. In our next lecture, we shall show how to make analysis of the financial statements and how to draw meaning, meaningful conclusions from these, this analysis. Thank you for today.